I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. When I read Ephesians chapter 3 and I see the prayer there, my mind goes to the question, what would you pray for if you were in prison? Would you pray for a short stay in prison? I think I might. I'd pray for a safe stay in prison. I'd also pray for the number of the best lawyer I could find to get me out. So in prison, Paul is there. And the reason he's in prison is because of his love for Jesus Christ and his love for lost people. And his sense of the wonder of what God is doing in the church. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. Paul is saying, I could have just stayed at home, shared the gospel with people who were from the Jewish background. But what God wants is not only Jews to be saved, but for all people to be saved. So Paul, called by God, fulfilled his call and moved from town, place to place, preaching the gospel, bringing in Jews and Gentiles, bringing in Irishmen and South Africans, even bringing in some Texans into the kingdom of God. And that powerful and passionate and persuasive preaching of Jesus by Paul landed him in prison. Paul has spent time in Philippi in a prison, in Jerusalem in a prison, in Caesarea in a prison. He was a prisoner on a ship. He was a prisoner on some of the islands in the Mediterranean Sea. And he finally arrived in Rome and he was a prisoner. Prisoner. Paul could have written a guidebook to the Roman prisons in the first century. He knew so many of them inside out. And he's praying for the church. Look what he does in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. He talks about the mystery. The mystery of what God is doing in the church. The mystery is that the Gentiles, you and me, not Jews, those who are not Jews, that the Gentiles we are fellow heirs. We are members of the same body. We are partakers of the promises of Christ Jesus. And Paul is saying, this blessing that God wants to give to the Gentiles, it is so wondrous that I am willing to go wherever I need to go, preach whatever I need to preach in dangerous situations, and even land in prison so that these Gentiles can have the opportunity to become family members of God's family, citizens in God's kingdom, living members in the living temple of God. And there's something wondrous happening in the church there in Ephesus and in the church here. Here's what he says in verse 7. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. That to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to bring to life for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden ages in God who created all things. Now I want to focus on verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Paul is saying, what God is doing in the church, bringing in people from a Jewish background and a Gentile background, people who used to worship in the pagan temples, people who used to go to the synagogue, people who used to worship and practice sorcery, God is now bringing them together and making them one new group of people. And this is so wondrous. So powerful. It's almost as if he's saying, we're almost like players on a stage. And all the heavenly realm is looking down and saying, I can't believe what God is doing in the church. I'm going to read it again. Verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God 
might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. And the church, not only is this playing to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, the power of God, we are showing our world the power of God to take people that are broken by sin, people that are alienated from each other and from God, and we are showing the world the power of God when we are reconciled back to each other, one new body of believers. And what our world needs right now, what our country needs that now, is for the church to show the power of God to reconcile broken people. Our world is broken. You see it every time you watch the news. It breaks my heart to see the depths of brokenness that I see in people. And they don't know that in Jesus they can be healed. In Jesus they can be made whole. And they need to see the power of Jesus at work in the church. And then he says, verse 11, This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom... We have boldness and access with confidence to our faith in him. So I ask you, do not lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. And then, in the next verse, Paul begins to pray for the church in Ephesus. All of chapter 1 is a prayer. Now he prays one quarter of of the book of Ephesians are prayers. Look at this prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. The typical way for Jewish men in the first century and for Christians was to stand with their arms uplifted. For now, Paul is kneeling, and this lets us know this is intense. It clues us into the fact that what Paul is about to ask God is really ratcheting it up to the next level. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. The church, they're in Ephesus. They're a family, but they're struggling a bit. And while they have begun their new walk of faith, there is a bit of a struggle to wield their lives together and become one body, one body, one family, one kingdom. Some of that old way of thinking as Jews and Gentiles, it's just hanging on too long. And they're not really being the powerful witness in their city to the power of God. And so Paul prays for them. Be one family, and I'm praying to God who is the God of the family. And then he says that according to the riches of his glory. He may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. He's saying, I'm not asking God just to skim a little bit off the top and give you a little measure of his power. I'm praying and I'm asking God to reach down deep into the infinite well of his mercy and from there bless you with Holy Spirit power. I said in the Bible class this morning, when I read these type of prayers, I want to say to Paul, no thank you. I'm comfortable coasting where I am right now. A little bit of a change now and again is okay. A light Lick a paint to make me look better is okay. I don't know if I want God to reach down into the very depths of my being and begin his restoration process. Okay, I want to get baptized and I want to wash away that, away that top layer of sin. It's okay. I'm not sure if I want the Holy Spirit to reach down into the deepest parts of my being and with all the power that's in the Holy Spirit begins to radically change me. Sometimes that's a little bit too much. And Paul says, you don't get to tell me what I'm going to pray for you. That's, that's terrifying. Other people can pray for you? 
And they can pray, God, let loose all your power in their life. Wake them up from their complacency. Transform them. Make them anew fully and completely into the image of Jesus Christ. Wow, that is some prayer. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your heart's true faith. So he's praying to the Father for the strength of the Spirit and the indwelling Jesus. You know that a Paul calls upon the Father and the Son and the Spirit to work in our life. This is a serious, powerful, transforming prayer. And look what he asks God to do. God, give him a brand new Mercedes. No, that's not what he asked for. He says... So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, what happens? What happens when the Spirit strengthens you? No, it's living in your heart. What happens? What's the result of that? Here's what he says happens. That you being rooted and grounded in love. See, the problem they're having in Ephesus ultimately comes down to a lack of love. Now, this love is biblical love. This is not, I almost said a word there that means the trouble with my wife, so i got to rephrase that. This is not just having the warm fuzzies on the inside that I like someone. This biblical love is serving love. It's sacrificial love. It is being with people that are very different from you, Jews with Gentiles and Gentiles with Jews, and learning to spend time with them and getting to know them. And building your life with them and maturing with them and being transformed with them into the community that God wants us to be. That you would be rooted and grounded in love. Maybe at a time in my life I said, I want to be rooted and grounded in knowledge. I want to be rooted and grounded in faith. And they have their place. But what the church in Ephesus needed was to be rooted and grounded in Love. And also what I see here is Paul is doing something that's wonderful. He's almost evoking a type of spiritual imagination. Sometimes we get into problems and we can't fix this using our own strength and our own power. And what we need is the spiritual imagination of prayer. That God, through the indwelling spirit and the indwelling Christ, would give us the power to address this. And the ultimate core issue at stake in Ephesus was lack of love. And they needed Holy Spirit power and Jesus indwelling power. So what happens? What happens if you would pray this prayer? And God would answer prayer and God would help you to be rooted and grounded in prayer. Rooted, it has that sense of a tree with deep roots. And when you have that type of root, it can withstand the greatest, most fierce storm. Rooted. Grounded is, is a tower that's built with a firm foundation. And the enemy can attack it, but it will stand firm. When we are rooted and grounded in spirit, Jesus, love, the church can withstand every challenge that comes against us. Rooted and grounded in love. And then he says that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. I can experience some of what it means to love God by myself. But to really experience God's love, I've got to hang around people that sometimes are hard to love. Which means sometimes you've got to hang out with me. <laughs> it's easy to love God in all his perfection. It's hard to love brothers and sisters sometimes. He says that you may comprehend with all the saints. If you want to grow in love, you need to learn to let the Holy Spirit work in your life 
to let Jesus who's in your heart help you to grow so you can learn to love each other with the love that Jesus has for you. Now, that's a hard, maturing love. And then he said, to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Jesus. Paul is praying that you would learn to love each other the way that Jesus loves you. The love of Jesus stretches from the beginning of time to the end of time. The love of Jesus reaches down to the very depths of the brokenness in our lives and the very mud-filled mire that we were in, and he comes in there to get us out. The love of Jesus takes us from that depth of sin, and it brings us up into the very presence of God himself. And he says, I want you to experience among each other a growing, maturing love for each other that imitates the love of Jesus. I can't do that. I know you can't. That's why you've got this spirit. That's why you've got Jesus in your heart. And then he says, and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. This love does not go around knowledge. It just goes beyond knowledge. A few years ago, my wife put me on the spot and she says, why do you love me? And I said, because you're Irene. And she said, why do you love me? And I was scratching and looking for reasons, and I couldn't find the reason except that my love was beyond knowledge. And I feel I'm digging a hole that i got to get out of very quickly. <laughs> I just can't fully understand the depth and the wonder of Christ's love for me. But I want to imitate it in how I love you. And then he says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul's prayer is for growth into maturity in love. It begins with the Holy Spirit and Jesus fully in us and strengthening us. It moves on to the next stage where we're rooted and grounded in love. It matures till we grow and grow and grow to the fullness of Christ's love. And again, I want to say, Paul, that's a great prayer, but it's so impractical. Don't you know how broken I am? Don't you know how selfish I can be? Don't you know that there's things in my life, in my past, I'm still struggling to overcome? And you don't know the people in the congregation. Man, some of them, they're hard to love. And the church said, amen. It's a great prayer, but it's totally impractical. It'll never happen. To which Paul answers, now to him. Who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think? According to the power at work within us, Paul is saying this, God will answer the prayer. And he talks about God's power in seven stages. God is able to do. All, more, far, abundantly than we ask or think. Paul has just asked God to fill us with Holy Spirit power that leads us to Holy Spirit love growing in the church. And then he says, now to him who is able to do. And so I'm reading this and I'm asking, do I believe God is able to do what Paul just asked. Yes, I believe it. And then I hear God saying, then why don't you pray it? Now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. How can God do that? He does this according to the power at work within us. What power is at work in us? The Holy Spirit's power that you received on the day you were baptized and the power that he just began the prayer when he says, I pray that God might strengthen you through the Holy Spirit. 
and the Christ who dwells in your heart through faith. I have confidence in God's power to radically and completely transform us into people to love each other with the transforming, majestic, immeasurable power of Jesus. Verse 21. To him be glory in the church. Now, why do we give God the glory? Because it's his power, his spirit, and his love. So he gives us the spirit, he gives us the power, he gives us the love, so he gets the glory. And the church said, amen. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ. The church and Christ. The head and the body. The bridegroom and the bride. Coexist to give God glory. Well, how do we give God glory? By loving each other through Holy Spirit power. Now to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Every generation. So you're telling me what Paul is just praying for and he's outlined that's not only for the first generation of Christians who are there in Ephesus. No, it's not. It's for every generation. It means it's for this generation. It's for us. Every generation of God's people that will exist until Jesus Christ return, we are called to love each other with Holy Spirit power, growing in love, maturing in love until we feel the fullness of God's love completely overwhelming us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. When Christ comes back, when Christ comes back, we will no longer need faith because the very center of our faith will be with us. When Christ comes back, that which we have most deeply hoped for will now be realized. So when Christ comes back, there will no longer be need for faith. Or hope. But the greatest of these is love. And love will go on to all eternity. Because for all eternity, the bride and the groom, the head and the body will coexist. They continue to give God glory. So if we are going to live forever in God's presence, giving Him glory. Let's give him glory today by loving each other through the power of the indwelling Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. In a few minutes, Galen is going to come and lead us in a song of invitation. I've got two invitations for you today. Maybe three. By the time I get to the end of the lesson, I might go with how it goes. Let me ask you to just pray this prayer every day for the next month. For the whole of June, pray this. Pray that you would see it more clearly and you would live it more faithfully in your life and in the life of this congregation. If you're here today and you're struggling with a brother or a sister in Christ and you're struggling with God's love, Maybe today is the day when you need to yield to the power of Jesus and the Spirit and let his work, powerful work help you to, to grow in love that you might love each other the way Christ is calling you to love. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, God loves you. God loves you. He's loved you from before the beginning of time. Christ loves you so much that he left the very presence of God and he entered into this broken world. He loves you so much that he went to the cross and he died a, hor a horrific death. And on the day of the resurrection, he rose out of the grave to show his power that he will give you to overcome both sin and death. The gospel is this core, wonderful story in the New Testament about the incarnation, but the life and the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So simple. And you can receive the blessings of the work of Jesus by your imitating the life, 
the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ in baptism. Wherever you are this morning and however you need to respond to this message, we encourage you to do so. As together, we stand and we sing our song of invitation.